Let's have prayer. Father, again we come to you. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And we ask your Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to help us to understand your word so that we can apply it in our lives. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would like to continue on the first angel a little more. Um, it says the judgment is come and um, I want to give a few more thoughts on the judgment. We read in 1 Samuel 16, 7, <clears throat> For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And outwardly, people can look very wonderful, while inwardly, they could have all kinds of corruption, right? Yes. Known corruption, remember that. Sin is known to the person. And I want to read a statement here, 5 Bible Commentary 1085. God's law reaches the feelings and the motives as well as the outward acts. It reveals the secrets of the heart, flashing light upon things before buried in darkness. So God is trying to help us to realize if we have secret sins in us, we must get rid of them. Amen. We are hiding them from the view of other people, but we know them. These are secret sins. God knows every thought. You see, that's secret. Other people don't know your thoughts. The good angels know your thoughts. Did you know that? Yes. The evil angels are not allowed to read your thoughts. But the good angels can. That's why they can help you right away when you're being tempted even by thoughts. Because they can be there to help you, to, to alert you. God knows every thought, every purpose. You're already purposing it in your heart. Every plan, you're already planning it. Every motive, your motives are going along with it. The books of heaven record the sins that would have been committed had there been opportunity. God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. By his law, he measures the character of every man. So you see, they're already planning it in their hearts, but they just didn't do it outwardly. The motives were already there to do it. They were acknowledging, they were planning those. They just hadn't carried it out. And God sees all of that that the heart is corrupted. Another one on this area. The law requires that the soul itself be pure and the mind holy, that the thoughts and the feelings may be in accordance with the standard of love and righteousness. And from Mount of Blessing we read, page 60, he who finds pleasure in dwelling upon scenes of impurity. Think of the TV and what Satan is doing. He who finds pleasure in dwelling upon scenes of impurity, who indulges the evil thought, the lustful look, may behold in the open sin with its burden of shame and heart-breaking grief the true nature of the evil which he has hidden in his own heart. So as you 
dwell on scenes of impurity on television and you are sitting there with pleasure watching sin God counts it as though you are doing it because you are taking it into your mind it is becoming a part of your thinking you see and you are enjoying it it says with pleasure sometimes we may watch a news report that is not good but we're not watching it with pleasure we're aghast at what we see there's a big difference but you sit in front of corruption with pleasure watching it fulfilling your mind God counts it as though you are a part of that cleanse your minds stay away from all evil the law of God takes note of the jealousy envy hatred malignity revenge lust and ambition that surge through the soul but have not found expression in outward action so here are all these emotions surging through the soul but you haven't expressed the hatred you haven't expressed the jealousy but it's been there because the opportunity has been wanting and these sinful emotions will be brought into the account in the day when God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil these are the secret sins they are not unconscious they are not unknown they are known to your heart and to God and the angels but other people don't know them that's why they are called secret sins I saw that many would fall this side of the kingdom God is testing and proving his people many will not endure the test of character the measurement of God many will have close work to overcome their peculiar traits of character and be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing and so we need to really pay attention to these things the heart God looks at the heart what is going on in the heart all right and another part of the first angel is worship worship who the creator. the creator and that's going to become a big issue isn't it a big issue and even now the situation is presenting itself for us to help people to realize that if they are honoring not God's day they are not worshiping God they are worshiping another Lord and they may not know it at this point but it's going to get more and more clear to people and and we must understand how to share with them the second angel <clears throat> what does the second angel tell us Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication who is Babylon Babylon it says here in great controversy 382 Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots by her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth 
and approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. The mother of harlots, which church in the world calls itself the mother church? Rome, Roman Catholicism. She openly calls herself the mother. And what is she doing to the daughters that left her? She's calling them back. And are they coming? Oh yes. Oh yes, they've come, right. It's amazing how it's all working out. What is the wine? Her false doctrines. She has given to the world a false Sabbath instead of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and has repeated the falsehood that Satan first told Eve in Eden. What was that falsehood? falsehood? Thou, shalt Thou shalt not surely die if you sin. Do we believe that falsehood? Do we? Many of our people do. They do. Oh, they don't believe that the dead aren't dead if they die. No. But they believe if they sin, they are still in Christ. Sin does not separate them from God. The soul that sins, it shall die. But many of our people believe a part of that falsehood. You shall not surely die. And they still believe God looks at them as though they had never sinned, even though they're down there sinning. Because they once accepted Christ. They are always covered in righteousness. There's no such teaching in the word of God. And that leaves people in sin. And God can never truly convict them that they are in a lost condition. It's very sad. Many kindred errors she has spread far and wide, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And I want to share this statement especially with us. Great Controversy 536-37. If we turn from the testimony of God's word and accept false doctrines because our fathers taught them, we fall under the condemnation pronounced upon Babylon. We are drinking of the wine of her abomination. If we turn from the truth in the word of God, and accept false doctrines because our fathers or our leaders taught them, we fall under the condemnation pronounced upon Babylon. We are drinking of the wine of her abomination. And you know there's a lot of wine being passed around among us. A lot of wine. And what is the worst wine? Amen. The wine that will leave you unsaved. Mm -hmm. Now there are certain things that are not a matter of life or death. But the wine that tells you you can be saved in sin will leave you out of the kingdom. That is what you have to really watch. Let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, I was drinking wine until 1970 when I started to study. What wine was I drinking? As long as you're trying, you're okay. 
you're covered. Where did I get that idea? Just from it being shared around so much. And I even have a diagram. Later on, when I started studying and started reading, I found books that had this diagram. This diagram. And this is what the teaching was. You come to Christ and you are saved just as if you never sinned. Well, that is true if you give him all your heart. But if you just accept a very surface experience, it's not true. But if you come with all your heart and he cleanses and he restores you and he regenerates you, yes, it's just as if you never sinned. And then he expects you to abide in him. But this person didn't understand that. He just came and believed and imputed righteousness covers him like a garment and they thought that, righteous, that the wedding garment was this outside covering. But that's not what it says. The wedding garment is the righteousness of saints allowing God to work in you his life. His character. It's what the Bible says. And the Bible says, watch that you go not naked and be seen exposed. Anytime you go back to sin, you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Look at it in a very practical way. If I get angry with this man over here, where is love? No. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness, meekness, faithfulness to represent Christ, self-control. Where is it? I am naked. I am naked. That's what it means. By their fruits ye shall know them. You cannot serve God and Satan at the same time when you judge yourself by your spirit by your attitude. But you see, this diagram says, yes, you can. You're still covered in his righteousness as long as you're trying. And little by little, you'll get better and better and better and you finally reach perfection and then you've made it. And that's what my father was striving to do and he never reached there. And... Uh, this is this they called imparted righteousness. This was imputed righteousness. And, and even though you went way down into sin here, the righteousness of Christ just covered you all the way. That's a lie. It's a lie. I never knew this diagram growing up. I just knew, keep trying and you'll make it and nobody taught me how to surrender to Christ, how to have the Holy Spirit working in my life. And so we all made excuses for our sins. Still thinking we were true Christians. I mean, my father, my father should have been in prison during those years. He was molesting his little girls. And I talked with, with a minister and, and I was sharing these things and he said, oh, your father, because he knew my father, he said, your father was a good man. I said, you don't know my father. I didn't know him either until I heard stories from my little sisters when they were grown up. Secret sins. But those weren't even really secret sins. But he should have been in prison. But I was talking to a theologian, a very well-known man among independent circles, and I was speaking in a group, 
and he was speaking and I was sharing this diagram and he walked out because he believed this and so I talked with him later and I said how much sin will God cover how much how deep can you go how awful can it be and he'll still count you righteous in his sight and so I shared with him my father's experience and the anger and the envy and the and the lust and the abuse yes your father was still covered still righteous in God's sight I said no way no way he should have been in prison but that's how far people will go with this diagram leaving the people deceived in sin let me read you a few statements that will help us to understand this and to see where the diagram came from when it is in the heart to obey God when efforts are made to this end Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service and he makes up for the difference with his own divine merit huh that's what it says well then it's true but let's look at the context let's make sure we read what goes before and after Where is that? it's in faith and works 50 it uh, also is in one selected messages but the whole statement is not there and this is what I have discovered people have used to to believe this diagram this is what this is statement they have used and I find it all over the world in Adventist circles no matter where I go if I show this diagram they said oh yeah that's what we believed and that's what left them in the lukewarm condition it's very sad let's read the whole statement there is no excuse for sin or for indolence Jesus has led the way and he wishes us to follow in his steps he has suffered he has sacrificed as none of us can that he might bring salvation within our reach we need not be discouraged Jesus came to our world to bring divine power to man that through his grace we might be transformed into his likeness when it is in the heart to obey God when efforts are put forth to this end Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit and you say well it's still saying that let's go further but always watch the but but he will not accept those who claim to have faith in him and yet are disloyal to his father's commandment very plain right after that statement I have never seen these statements along with the rest of it the whole story we hear a great deal about faith but we need to hear a great deal more about works Amen. many are deceiving their own souls by living an easygoing accommodating crossless religion Amen. you see it was a crossless religion you could do your own thing and live your own sins and still feel you were covered and there are many people who believe that 
What did he come to bring us to make up our deficiencies? Power. That's what it says in the statement. He came to bring divine power to make up for our deficiencies. I of myself can do nothing. He came to give me power. <coughs> Constantly God is working to make up man's deficiencies. And I want to read a few more statements here on page 127 in the book. Christ loves his church. He will give all needed help to those who call upon him for strength, for the development of Christ-like character. But his love is not weakness. Amen. He will not serve with their sins Amen. or give them prosperity while they continue to follow a wrong course of action only by faithful repentance will their sins be forgiven for God will never cover evil with the robe of his righteousness Amen. another statement <clears throat> the halo of glory which God had given holy Adam, covering him as a garment, departed from him after his transgression. The light of God's glory could not cover disobedience and sin. One Selected Messages 270 and One Selected Messages 115, I must speak the truth to all, those who have accepted light from God's word are never, never to leave an impression upon human minds that God will serve with their sins. God cannot abide in the heart and serve his righteousness to you while you are sinning. He must bring you back to repentance and cleansing. <clears throat> another one 7 Bible Commentary 933 Jesus stands in the Holy of Holies now to appear in the presence of God for us there he ceases not to present his people moment by moment complete in himself but because we are thus represented before the Father we are not to imagine that we are to presume upon his mercy and become careless, indifferent, and self-indulgent. Christ is not the minister of sin. We are complete in him, accepted in the beloved, only as we abide in him by faith. Only as we abide and let him control our spirit. And that should not discourage anyone because he is going to watch out for us and bring us back if we will only let him, right? Mm -hmm. And he will even send guardian angels to protect you from death until you come back to him. You see? It, it, it's actually wonderful. I am so glad that I know I am not covered in sin. Amen. Why? Because I know if I sin, I must come back to God, where before I excused it. And it's miserable living with a wrong spirit. <laughs> I don't want that anymore. <clears throat> Another one, one selected messages, 366. While God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul 
in order for man to be justified by faith, faith must reach a point where it will control the affections and impulses of the heart. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Amen. And Christ in you is the only hope of glory. Amen. And Christ cannot abide if there is known sin. <clears throat> so have we believing have we believed false doctrines yes. in that area yes many many of us we were deceived we didn't search it out we just went along with what our fathers taught us instead of knowing for ourselves. <clears throat> it says here that do not forget that the most dangerous snares which Satan has prepared for the church will come through its own members. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. We need to study. We need to know what we believe. False, the Bible says, 2 Peter 2, 1, false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Destructive heresies. And it says God will allow these heresies to come to test us because it'll help us to start thinking and to examine what we believe. And 5 Testimony 77, it may be that the destroyers are already training under the hand of Satan and only wait the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their places and with the false prophet cry peace, peace when there is no peace. What does that mean? Don't worry, brother. God still sees you as righteous even though you are sinning. Peace, peace when there is no peace. And the person who is sinning knows there isn't peace in the soul because the Holy Spirit won't give him peace. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. To not allow us to have peace when we're in known sin. But it says they will tell you, don't worry. And it says, with the false prophet they will say this. Who is the false prophet? Apostate Protestantism. Haven't they been teaching it all along? Yes. You see? And with the false prophet, destroyers among us will agree. And today, it's even stronger than it was before. Before, it was this kind of a diagram. Today, it's Jesus saves you. 2,000 years ago. I was told, Mrs. Davis, don't make it so hard to be saved. You were already crucified 2,000 years ago. Just believe it. I said, no, I was not. I was not crucified with Christ until I understood how to die to self. Amen. And I was 46 years old at the time. And this is a person who goes around teaching people you were already crucified 2,000 years ago. Just believe. We need to examine what we hear 
and what we read. Because Satan is doing his utmost to leave people thinking they are saved while sinning. Because then he knows they can't be saved. You don't have to do some terrible thing. Just excuse your resentment, your bitterness, your anger, your impatience, your irritation, and you can be lost. Every phase of fanaticism and erroneous theories claiming to be the truth will be brought in among the remnant people of God. Every phase. In order to sustain erroneous doctrines or unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of scripture separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving their point when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the opposite. And so if anyone comes with a text or a quote that leaves you saved in sin, go and look at the full context because they are using it out of context. <clears throat> How much time do we have left? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I'd like to read a few um, quotes here at the back. Um, there is a teaching that only the 144,000 have to finally have a pure character. And so people are told, strive to be among the 144,000. But if you don't make it, don't worry. Because the others will be saved without this pure character. No, there's no such teaching. Let me read you a few quotes. <clears throat> and I have a whole section in my book on this tradition. And it's been a tradition among us for many, many years. Signs of the Times, 1891. First of all, the Bible says, Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How many people see the Lord without holiness? No man. no man. What is holiness? Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. That's holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see God. We are looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We may not be living when Christ shall come in power and great glory. For all are subject to death at any time. But if we are righteous in harmony with the law of God, we shall respond to the voice that will call the people of God from their graves and shall come forth to receive immortality. It is only the blessed and holy who will be ready for the first resurrection. And what is holiness? Holy surrender to God. It is only the blessed and holy who will be ready for the first resurrection. For when Christ comes, he will not change the character. The word of God declares we must be found blameless, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Another quote to help you. The Lord reproves and corrects the people who profess to keep his law. He points out their sins and lays open their iniquity because he wishes to separate all sin and wickedness from them that they may perfect holiness in his fear and be prepared to die in the Lord or to be translated to heaven. Both require the same thing. 
holiness. God rebukes, reproves, and corrects them that they may be refined, sanctified, elevated, and finally exalted to his throne. God will accept nothing but purity and holiness. One spot, one wrinkle, one defect in the character will forever debar them from heaven with all its glories and treasures. All have sufficient light to see their sins and errors if they desired to do so and earnestly wish to put them away and to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. God is too pure to behold iniquity. As sin is just as grievous in his sight in one case as in another. No exception will be made by an impartial God. If you know you have sin, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God deals with known things. The guilty know just what sins to confess, that their hearts may be pure before God. Secret sins are known sins, not unconscious. And when Jesus comes, he will make atonement for all sins of ignorance, things that you didn't know. But known sins must be confessed beforehand and let go. God is very careful in how he deals with his people. He is very loving, he is very kind, but he cannot save us in sin. He cannot. Sin would start all over again if we didn't come to the place where we want it to go and let him change us. <clears throat> There's another statement here that I use in that section of showing that it's not only the 144,000 who need this experience. <clears throat> All will be glorified together. You see, some people teach that the 144,000 will allow Jesus to get them all cleansed up and therefore God can save the ones who didn't get cleansed up and died in their sins. There's no such teaching in the word of God. It just comes from man's reasoning. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with Christ as his bride. The victory of the sleeping saints will be glorious in the morning of the resurrection. So the sleeping saints are also his bride. And this false teaching says only the 144,000 are the bride. And the lukewarm will all be in heaven, selfish little flower girls looking for the cake and ice cream while the 144,000 are waiting for the bride, bridegroom. There's no such teaching. All the saved are the bride. Amen. They have all been redeemed. They all sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. <clears throat> and where do they get this thinking from? <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 39, and 40. These all, having obtained, it's talking about the, the righteous through the ages, they obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having providing some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. And they use that to make a teaching that the 144,000 will be perfect, therefore God can make all the dead perfect who didn't overcome, but they believed. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that the dead are not going to receive the kingdom before the living. 
and the living are not going to receive the kingdom before the dead. We're all going to receive it at the same time. That's all it's saying. <clears throat> all must have the wedding garment. All are the bride of Christ. All must have God's name in the forehead. What does it mean to have God's name in the forehead? It says that name signifies the yielding of the will to God. Amen. Who will go to heaven who has not yielded his will? You see? Because if you don't yield your will here, how can God trust you in heaven? You won't be there. And that's what it means to have the name of God in your forehead, yielding your will to him. <clears throat> Not my will, but thine. Moral perfection is required of all. We all. We've all talked about that. All must have a new birth experience. Um, <clears throat> Jesus said very plainly, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. All must have the mind of Christ. This happens in the new birth experience. And all must open the heart's door and allow Jesus to come in. And that's what the lukewarm have not done. They have not opened the heart's door. He is still knocking. And they think they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And they know not that Jesus is still standing outside the door. But if they would just start studying, instead of believing fables, they would soon find out what it means to have Christ in them, the hope of glory. <clears throat> There's many more here. All must be saved to the uttermost. The thief was saved to the uttermost. And you and I, today, can be saved to the uttermost. Just like the thief. Surrender your heart. Here I am, Lord. I give you all my heart, all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me wholly thine. May the Lord help each one of us every day to do that to live in Christ and let him live in us and to learn to walk without falling because when probation closes there will be no more forgiveness but it closes just shortly before Christ comes and so he wants us to settle in which is the ceiling so that nothing will move us away from Christ. May the Lord help each one of us to do that. Because he has made all the provision necessary to keep us from falling. Thank you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you have made the way of salvation plain for all those who are willing to study. And Father, help us to study. To study as we have never studied before. That we may know the way. And that we may walk with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.